as well. You good? Yes, yeah, Paul. Yeah, really Too bad. What's been, going on, what's been going on in lockdown then? Have you been staying sane? Have you been keeping your hands on the rudder of the game? Because obviously we've all been in our flats, in our houses, on our farms, all on our own. And while we might be able to train hard and speak on Zooms, it's a lot different to being in a team, in a club environment, or, or for you, Dazza, a university environment. Going well. Yeah, so, um, so lockdown for me was, I was rehabbing a hamstring injury. So I was sort of made a makeshift gym in the garage back on the farm up north. Uh, very makeshift gym. And it sort of just got me by. So I was, I was gymming on a morning and then I was running uh, sort of after that because the sevens were sort of sending me through a schedule that I was following just to sort of make sure I was getting sort of ticking all the boxes on the, on the rehab road, really. Uh, other than that, it was the afternoons were spent really working on the farm. I was back with my brother and my dad <coughs> and um, just sort of keeping busy, sort of helping out where I could. Um, yeah, it was just like going back for a summer holiday, really. Uh, I don't think they really knew there was a pandemic going on back up there. So isolated. What about you, Dad? What about you, Dazza, being away from the hustle and bustle of university? Yeah, it was. It was. It was obviously very different, um, as it has been for everybody. But for me, it was. It was quite a nice opportunity to firstly spend time with the, with the family without having things like the pressure of a fixture on a Wednesday and and, and everything that goes with that, and organising sort of seven teams as a director of rugby. It, it was. It was quite a nice break. Um, Pretty sharpish though. I'd, I'd say I started to miss it, um, but there was a, there was a lot of content with regards like opportunities to learn, and, that, and I think that was a lot of coaches I've spoke to have, have made use of that time by doing that. Um, you could start looking at yourself, and re you you had naturally time to reflect. So I, I I would like to think coming out the other end, we we were a week into our our training at the moment, and I, and I the way I'm sort of seeing the lads and, and, and the women's team progressing in the content and whatnot and the plans we've got in place i'd like to think it, it's naturally put us on a, on a good path sort of on and off the field so yeah it's, it, it presented an opportunity really mate. well you mentioned that being being first week back and freshers week is right on the horizon and it's going to look completely different to any freshers week than came before I'm sure you're beginning to reminisce in your mind, Will, to yours. I've got to go back a little bit further than everyone in this conversation to remember mine. But it was fresh as fairs. It was nights out. It was meeting new people. It was getting to training and, and creating those initial relationships that you take through three years of uni and in a rugby sense, some friendships and some bonds that you're going to take forward onto the pitch, hopefully to some, to some, to some, to some success. Um, so Dazza, tell me, what is it looking like for these freshers now coming into university and trying to be captured by teams, by societies, and then trying to make friends in these new clubs? So naturally, mate, as, as you mentioned, it, it looks a lot different um, because of what's going on at the moment. But so what we've tried to do at uh, Newcastle University is have sort of transitioning people in. So again, as I'm sure you can imagine, with, with seven teams within the books programme across men and women, You've got a lot of numbers now. A lot of numbers together at the moment is, is obviously not a good thing to be doing. So it's about how do we make sure, and, and this was what the plan was about, how do we make sure we can transition people in where we can make it as safe as possible within RFU guidelines, within university guidelines and government guidelines. So at the moment, we've been working as very small groups. Um, again, following the RFU protocol. That's just returners at the moment. Then what we'll do is we'll start, when the first year start transitioning in, which is happening at the moment, they're moving into their accommodation staggered. People we're aware of, so people we've naturally gone out to recruit will start to transition in again in small groups, looking at also being within their halls of residence. So again, we're not having massive crossover between groups of players. Then what we'll do is we'll start opening sort of sessions with the with, with people we're maybe not aware of but are really keen to get involved in the club. Now the important thing with that is is naturally the track and trace. So the track and trace is you need to be aware of who's coming onto the facilities at the university so we had to we, we've had to and the committee have done a fantastic job of this again across the men and women's program is actually highlighting what we, what we need information wise people have got in touch we've got the key information we need from these first years 
and then we can start planning from there. So again, it's there's a lot of things going into it, such as risk assessments, um, sort of protocols, guidelines, like I say, but the key is it, it's it's a massive plan, but we are going to have an offer. It looks different on certain levels, but again, as, I keep, as I've mentioned before, there's an opportunity on other levels. So that that's where we're at. Things could change as we've seen things change weekly, daily at the moment, but that's where we're at at the moment, and we'll just we'll just move with the times. We're we're excited to get going, and again, we'll we'll do it by the book. Yeah, you know, it, is that going to make it difficult for young players coming in who maybe don't have a famous CV or a celebrated CV to make an impact? Because you've got to be a bit more selective about the players that are coming into the environment and the way you're integrating them. Do you think that's going to limit opportunities? Unfortunately. You know what, I think actually, Burns, it's, it's, it's the opposite. And I've talked about this with the other coaches in the committee. So in, in the past, sort of freshers trials or first years trials have been, they've been sort of a, a quick session with regards maybe skill basis. And then there's a game, and I'm sure Will will talk about this from his experience when, when he went to the trials or whatnot. And then you see them in, in, in sort of a small window. Now what we've got an opportunity is to see them in naturally smaller groups in an actual specific session where all eyes are on them. So that doesn't mean that there's extra pressure and if they don't perform, that's it, shot done. That's, that's not the case at all. It, it's more about, right, we can see what people are about, we can get to know them better as people, and then we can keep in touch with them because naturally we've got their information there because of the track and trace. So there's, there's much more. It's, it's a bit more personal, I feel, this year. But I'm speaking from a Newcastle University point of view. I, I can't speak for everybody, but I'd imagine it's, it's very similar across the board. So I think it's actually, again, it's a huge opportunity to get to know these people better and almost give them a bit more of an opportunity over a period of weeks. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's difficult to make an impression or you have to work hard to make an impression in that first week and in the, that first term at university. Will, what was your freshers week? What was your fresh year like in um, the university and a rugby sense? <clears throat> yeah, so... Um... I think what Daz was saying there, I think that's a much better idea that would sort of resonate well with me because I never really had much success going through North Yorkshire trials, Yorkshire trials where it's just like a day trial sort of growing up. Um, and when it came to uni freshers week, I know the, the trials were in the middle of the week alongside all these freshers nights out and everything. So I made sure to have a night off before the, before the trials. And then, um, yeah, it was, like you say, everyone's trying to just prove themselves. There's like a lot of people together and it's like a, it's a tough sort of environment to be in to try and prove yourself. And I think what Daz is saying there, the structure that they're going to do at Newcastle sounds a lot like personally for me, I think that would be a, a lot more beneficial. How, to, what are your top tips for making that impression in the trials? Because we've all been in them at various points in our lives be that at county or at school or club university and it's so hard to make an impression sometimes when you've got you know 50 other players trying to do it and you've either got to put a massive hit in or be the noisiest bloke on the park so you look like an amazing communicator that no one can do without like how, how do you go about making that impression yeah well i just i just try and concentrate on my own game not worry too much about what everyone else is doing and just sort of players you normally would don't try and and throw like daft offloads to try and catch an eye or try and do everything on your own i think it's more about just doing the basics right and showing that you're uh, you can sort of consistently perform really but it, it, like i say it's hard and it's it's a tough environment to try and prove yourself what about you dad what are you looking for well, I thought Will was going to say wear the worst kit going, wear boots from the 1980s, because that's what he, the first time I seen him, he had the worst cover on. There was he was like, it was this kid, and he turned up, and he was he was he was awesome, like, and he walked throwing offloads because he couldn't throw offloads like that. That's why. He didn't. <laughs> um, but no, it's, it, again, like he's, he's saying there, this this presents an opportunity to to get to know them. I, I came through it as a player as well, and it's. It is a hard opportunity to see everybody, and that's why people sort of naturally come into it, maybe in the second years, third years, or it takes a bit of time to embed. So, yeah, it, it, you hear the stories about people wearing sort of bright clothes so they stand out, or like you say, being real noisy, or turn up in the mitts, full England kit, and it's like, that'll get me in. It might work somewhere, but for me, it's about the bigger picture. Like, there's going to be an opportunity, especially a club like 
a, a lot of universities where there's a number of teams, in, and I'm sure if you've got the right sort of actions and behaviours through a year, you'll naturally, it's like any walk of life, if you, if, if you go the right way about it, and you make good choices, and you buy into something, and you communicate well, you, you're going to be successful. Right? And that, I do think that's very relatable to sort of a, a rugby um, environment, especially at a university with all the other things going on. Well, it's it's important as well, isn't it, for players not to think, look, I've only got one shot at this, and if I don't land it on the bullseye first time, then that's me done and dusted for university, because you can come to the fore over your career. You've got three years to make that impact, impact and build your story, which leads us nicely to you, Will, because as you said, you didn't have a big celebrated rugby CV. Um, you haven't had any representative honours, and you were playing twos, threes in your first year, and it was only in your second year when you started to get into the mix uh, with the first. So can you tell us a little bit about your, your rugby story and then, you know, developing into a Northumbria University first team try scoring legend? <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, you asked yeah, him to so... say it, Will. You asked him to say it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's word for word what I wanted. Um, yeah, so... My dad took me and my brother down to Gisborough's Mini and Juniors when we were about nine or ten. Uh, played for a few years, used to watch my dad play on a Saturday for the first team till he was well into his mid 40s. And then um, took a few years out, played football, and then sort of realized rugby was sort of the sport that I was enjoying the most. So at under 16s, went back to Gisborough, played through Gisborough Colts, was really loving rugby. Um, and then it came to the point where I was going to university and I was playing for Gisborough first team at the time, loving it there, really enjoying it. Um, and then started playing, went to them fresher trials and got playing for the third team at Northumbria. So I was playing for Gisborough on a Saturday and then the Northumbria thirds and sort of seconds on a Wednesday. Uh, and then that was my first year of uni all the way through, really. And then it wasn't until second year when Daz came and sort of made a few changes to the program. It was more of like a professional environment. I remember him ringing me actually. Um, it was during the summer holidays. I think I was on a tractor at home putting some hours in. And then um, he rang and he said, would you be interested in coming to do the pre-season at Northumbria? And I was sort of to and fro about it, thinking about, because I'm playing for Gisborough, would I rather play for Northumbria first? Uh, well have a shot at playing North and Rear first. And uh, he convinced me to go down went, and we did a pre-season through summer, which meant sacrificing some hours on the farm during harvest, which didn't go down too well with the family. And then, uh, yeah, he um, at the end of it, he said, I'm sort of quite impressed with how I'd done and then sort of took off from there, really. Started playing some first team games uh, and that took me all the way through till end of third year. Dad, how That's did me. how did you so how did you identify Will? Bearing in mind that he hadn't made an impression on the first team at that stage, what was it that marked him out? How do you keep an eye on these players who come in and they don't jump straight into the first team fold and make sure that you've got an eye on the succession plan? So for me, it goes back to again your own experiences shape a lot within sort of your beliefs and sort of core values. And for me, I was similar to Will as, as a player, like. Because of the background I'd had with regards to coming up, I, I didn't play any representative rugby. I was from a coastal town, which, like, it was, it, it, there was a lot going on there with regards. It was a great, it was a great town, good people, but it was, it, it was hard to. There was not many opportunities. That's the best way to put it. You, you had to work for your opportunities, and they weren't necessarily going to be presented. So, I think it's really important that you give people an opportunity. Now, for Will, I, I'd come into. The, the role at Northumbria, sort of four, four, uh, it was four years ago now, and I was handed a spreadsheet with a lot of players. Will was down as a standoff, I think. Was it you, you Will? Standoff twelve, yeah. I think you were listed as. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, and it was, and, I, and it wasn't somebody. It wasn't highlighted as just lad who's going to be, and not a lot of people were. But I, everybody deserves a crack, and I wanted to make sure I could see everybody who had been involved before and met my own opinion. I think it's really important in every walk of life that you make your own opinion about things because everybody has different relationships, everybody has different experiences with people. Um, and that's what it sort of came down to. And I, I'm, I'm still a big believer on that. 
people are going to make mistakes. And if their mistakes are just sort of minor mistakes and you give people a second chance, especially people like are at universities, there's a million and one things going on. There's a social, there's academic, there's work experience. You don't know where, what people's backgrounds are, do people need an extra job, do people got things going on at home. We, we, we need to be aware of that and show empathy with all of that. So that's the sort of broader picture which leads me to think these people need an opportunity. So just because he was listed as maybe not higher up the list as a standoff, I, I wanted to get to know him. He, I wanted to give him the opportunity to come down. He, he, he didn't sound over keen on the phone, but I getting to know him now that's not because he lacked any ambition it's because he didn't know what it would look like and it's quite an intimidating environment at the time. i found that when i joined university it's you have these stories that you hear you see players who've gone on and played a good level of rugby and you think am, am i up to that like, almost that imposter syndrome is, is am i about that um and, and thankfully the case study there with will and there's quite a lot of others he came through and he, he surpassed well, he, he was always capable of it. That's why he's there. He's, he's going to push on to bigger and better things because he always wants to learn. But I'm, I'm really, really proud of him for making that decision to come down and see where he is now. Well, Gisborough haven't really suffered too much since uh, Will's departure. I just had a look at their last three results. They won 38-22, 151-0 and 102-7. Flat track bully horse. They didn't need me at all, I don't think. Someone just filled my shoes straight away and they didn't buy an eyelid about me leaving, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, you went you went to Northumbria with no expectation of a rugby career. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It wasn't until second year when really speaking to Daz and seeing the setup that he'd brought and he sort of made me sort of realise, because I remember thinking, between my second and third year, I was I was considering doing a placement year for my course. And I remember having a conversation with him and him saying that this could this could sort of stutter your development in rugby sort of and uh, there could be an opportunity for you there to be doing it professionally. And that it wasn't really till then that I sort of realised that it was really an option. So I decided to go against the placement um, and give rugby a crack and I haven't really looked back since, really. Dazza, that, that is a, that's a massive conversation for you to be having with someone who has no previous rugby track record. And, well, you were, the, you were there to do mechanical engineering, so I presume that you have had or still have designs after rugby to become an engineer. But that's for you to, you know, to convince him to not take that year placement and stay for the rugby. Obviously, you saw a lot of potential. But do you think that's a really good reflection of the nurturing environment of university rugby that coaches are, are looking to make the best decisions for their boys without also sacrificing their educational desires or progression in the future as well? Yeah, and it's, that's important as well. For the, so it's all, again, it goes to the bigger picture. Like what, what sort of Will's plan within, it, was, it wasn't just a conversation like, Dad's been thinking about going on placement with me going, oh, don't do that, mate. Stay do the rugby. There's a lot of thought gone into it. It was a case of, right, what, what, what's your plan long term within employment? Because as much as I believe you can go and play pro rugby, it might not happen. Like this, this, we're fully aware we don't need to go into it. There's different reasons these things might not happen. So, what's your plan? He, he wasn't 100% certain, but he was doing well in his course. Again, he was studying me uh, mechanical engineering. Then he was like, have you got a solid placement that you really, really want to do? And is that placement and work experience maybe going to be there in a different walk of life, so maybe after or maybe in his third year? So all these things painted the bigger picture. It wasn't an obvious like hindrance to his employment if he stayed at university for, and studied and didn't go on his placement year. So that was all the conversations we had. Obviously, his mum and dad are really good people. I've got to know them well through it all as well. They're awesome people and they were guiding him and advising him as well. So as a collective, it sort of there was a natural decision to go. So if he had said, listen, I'm going to go on placement, I'd have fully support his placement, tried to help him transition into a local club so that he could keep developing. He started, decided to, day, to say, and it worked for him. It didn't work by accident, it worked because he worked hard. And he also, a year later, graduated with a first-class degree in mechanical engineering and a pro contract with England Sevens. So to me, like, it was a, the conversation wasn't necessarily hard because it all made sense from... Again, all the avenues that go to being a student, a rugby player or not. And then the outcome came because we fully invested in it. He fully invested it. He did the hard work. And then, yeah, he, he, 
pushed on and on from us very well. Yeah, well, amazing, amazing decision. Now, now we're looking at it. Um, look, we focused on the horse a lot, and we focused on rising to the top. But rugby clubs at university offer a lot more than that. There's a lot, lot more roles for people to play. And Dazza, you're a prime example that you weren't initially going to go to university. You pursued pro rugby, but then you had an opportunity to study at Northumbria. And while you've always been involved in coaching, pretty much since you got in, got into the game it gave you a much bigger opportunity to pursue your coaching dream. So I want to focus on not the playing aspect, but the other elements that being a part of a university rugby club can bring to you as a person and your future potentially. Yeah, so for me, again, I've sort of touched slightly on my route into it. I was, I always wanted to, I always had ambitions, a bit like Will, to be, I'd love to have played professional rugby, but the opportunities that I didn't get, like I mentioned before, I didn't get into County set up. I didn't. I didn't get into a professional environment. I, I was brought up in Yorkshire as well, North Yorkshire too, actually. Um, and with that, you, you sort of. I started to drive, but I wanted to become a. I wanted. To, I knew I wanted to teach. Like my mum was a teacher, and my dad became a teacher eventually. And I thought, you know, what? I really enjoy that. I enjoy working with people. I enjoy coaching specifically. So I was looking at doing PE. I didn't know if I wanted to go to university because I'll be honest with you, academically, I, it. I never lacked effort. I always wanted to be the best at everything I did, but it didn't come easy to me. So I had to work very hard to get into sixth form. Now, a lot of my friends um, didn't necessarily want to go to university. The, the area I was brought up in, I, I went to school in a council state in, in Scarborough, one of the biggest council states in North Yorkshire. And there's some wonderful people there. And I've still got friends there now. And, and my family still live in Scarborough. But like I said before, the opportunities weren't necessarily there. And sort of edu uh, the, the education sort of, Entertainment with it and the job opportunities, they are quite limited. You, you sort of out, you're out there. So, did I want to go to uni? I don't know. And then rugby actually presented the opportunity to do that. I went to sixth form. I played England colleges. And the YDO at the time in Scarborough had a friend who was coaching at Northumbria and he said, "This got a kid here is a prop. And if you're a prop, does open generally more than than others because people always need need a prop." So he was like, "Right, we'll have a look." And I actually went to night school in Newcastle. So I said to my mum and dad, like, my family are so supportive of me and, and they've been absolutely fantastic. And I had a discussion, like, I've got an opportunity to go to uni. My grades aren't particularly bad, but I'm going to have to go to night school. Within a week, I was in a, we'd got a bedroom sorted in a house in Newcastle and I moved up to Newcastle away. I didn't have any mates there. I'd never been to a city before. I was thinking big, what I'd seen on films, I was thinking big lights, like, a coastal town boy, what, what am I coming into? And I was, I was absolutely bricking it. Um, I'd just seen Newcastle Falcons feature on Middlesex Sevens. Remember Middlesex Sevens? They just yeah, won yeah. it. And it was like Scotty Riddell, Mickey Young, who were actually affiliated with Northumbria University at the time. And it was like, whoa, like, I am not good enough to be mixing it with them. So I went there, and again, a bit like Will, I'm so grateful I did because it opened doors, so many different avenues, like work experience. Like I, I got the opportunity to do some work with the RFU between, I think it was actually the year I was starting university degree course from going to night school. And I, I got some work experience within a prison, which the RFU provided, and that was awesome. Like, to talk about empathy as a coach and understanding people. What an opportunity that was looking back to work with people that are locked up like, in a prison and to get to go out and they're not necessarily from rugby backgrounds. You don't know what you, you're going into. And do you know what? Within that hour and a two hour coaching over a sort of six week period, it was quality. I enjoyed it, they seemed to enjoy it, and I learned a lot from that. I've done a lot with special needs kids because my mum worked at special needs school and I was at exposure behaviour units, my dad worked at behaviour units. So people who are not necessarily the pathway, I was presented with that opportunity. I studied coaching and development at university. So naturally, like we talk about, the work experience came from that. The CPDs, which the RFU put on, the Student Rugby Union put on, which almost grow you, and it's, it's that CV enhancement and that work placement's massive. It's easy just to look at rugby and go, playing on a Wednesday, train on a Monday, train on a Friday for three years, and that's what we're going to do. And if I get a pro contract, that's what university and club is about. It's not. There's, there's, the CV enhancement's massive. The social element's massive with regards to getting to know people. The independence being away from, for me, it was my, my family who had been around for 17 and a half years. So there's so much that comes with it. Um, and yeah, it's I, I could go on for hours about the opportunities that sort of rugby clubs and universities provide for you if, if you actually go out there and grab them opportunities and speak to people i think that's the key to communicate 
there's a lot of people there with student support services, with the student rugby union. They've done some brilliant webinars over lockdown. The RFU, and then the rugby clubs, the DORs. I know a lot of the DORs and heads of rugby at the universities are really good people, and they'll, they'll look after you. And they've really got that people first approach. So be vocal, talk to them, and, and just open up. There's things like mental health campaigns. There's, I could go on for hours about the, the, the things that are there to help you. I think it's really important. That if you want to find out more, you just go and have a discussion with somebody. Yeah, do you know? Do you know what? I think that's such an important thing to stress because I think that the perception is that. And probably rightly so is that rugby have quite a narrow channel into the game from various schools and various backgrounds. But uh, yeah, your story is a testament that you can come into the game and you can benefit not just in rugby terms or in career terms, but as you said, the social life, the life skills, um, the experiences that you go through. And that's also happened to quite a few of your players. I know that Josh Bragman has got an interesting story. He's now playing the Hartbury in the championship that he played, he was your 10, Will, and played under you, uh, very, very key part of your successful Northumbria team, and then the England shooting team. Um, well, you talk, you mentioning about speaking to Hartbury and then Josh going down to Hartbury, that's a very good example of the network that the universities have, that yes, you may go to Northumbria, yes, you may be playing up in the north, but if there's an opportunity, say at Bath, say at Hartbury, in Exeter. In fact, recently we've seen Josh Hodge from Northumbria move to Exeter and now he's got tongues wagging from his performances in the Premiership. That that network exists and the motives of all the coaches in the institutions are purely for the players. Obviously, Newcastle Falcons, I'm sure, would have loved to have, have kept Josh Hodge, but there but Northumbria I don't know the ins and outs, but we're probably happy to facilitate a move to Chiefs for him and, and they're proud of his development and his progression as a player. Is that right? Yeah, I mean... Oh, yeah. Am, I, am I making that up? No, no, no. There's, there's so many different situations. Josh was actually already in the academy. So Josh came through Sedba, which again, we, we all know how what quality school that is. He came through Sedba and then wanted to study. So he studied for a year and then he, he decided that he was going to go to the Chiefs. And that was, again, I think the club were aware of it. I, I don't know the full ins and outs. He had an opportunity. They didn't stand in his way. He went and signed it. And credit to Josh as well. He, he's he's doing really well for himself, and he seems to be enjoying it. And from speaking to the lads, of it, oh, he's been really well. And speaking to um, like some of the coach down there, Keith Fleming, at Exit, I think he's the team manager as well as the Chiefs. He's, yeah. he's a top bloke. And again, it, it, it's a great little network. And it's the same at Newcastle, like with with the Falcons. They've got lads that they're one of they're very pro the university game. And they're fortunate to have three very good universities around them, but. They make the most of it. I speak to Mark Laycock, the academy manager there, weekly. Like we come for conversations. I knew him when I was at the club as well. But again, Newcastle University last year, our captain, Bailey Ransom, he signed full-time. He's a full-time player there, having come from down south. He came from down south. Newcastle weren't aware of him. Came through the Associate Academy, which is partnered with Newcastle Uni. He went through them books. Signed you know, Dan Nutton, who signed full-time at Edinburgh. So yeah, there's across the border within the Eng within England there's a really good network of rugby people who want to see the development of people on and off the field and that's the same down the league as well we're not just talking premiership the RFU are brilliant at transitioning like the RFU partnerships really look at the growth and sustainability of the game so it makes sure that people get the opportunity if they don't want to if they're not going to get for a contract which let's be honest not a lot of people are and not some people don't want to they want to go and work somewhere and play rugby because they enjoy it and if we can transition them into clubs and people know that they're coming that means a pathway from sort of school rugby to local club rugby to university and then to clubs, which, whichever level that may be. So we, we've, co we've covered you breaking into the first team. I don't know, uh, uh, well, everyone should know. Does, does, does he still have the record for the most tries in one season or did Tom, Doughty, did Tom Doughty break that? I think Will's still got it. The most in one season, but Tom Doughty's the most of all time, I think. <laughs> But from that point, your rise through the rugby ranks has been pretty meteoric and pretty cool. Can you tell us the story about how you got into the England sevens fold and your first full senior tournament for them? So, uh, yes, yeah, so I was playing for Northumbria. We'd done um, the national sevens and we'd won it in my second year. Uh, and then going into third year, 
played the singer seven singer premiership sevens for falcons and then it was a couple of weeks after that i got a call from simon amor and he was asking if i wanted to go over to south africa for a sevens academy tournament which okay. obviously yeah. was overwhelmed with <laughs> um so i jumped jumped down to london did a, a week's training then flew over to south africa for a week and then we went straight from south africa to san jose to play the silicon sevens in america so that's three weeks of uni that i managed to get out of and get my deadlines pushed back and everything so that was okay and then yeah sort of from there i think managed to do enough to to sort of catch an eye and then finish the books season with northumbria graduated and then it was i think two or three days after my graduation flew out to um san francisco for the sevens world cup which would be my senior debut so yeah playing the, the world cup in san francisco and graduating in the same week was a uh, pretty crazy um and that was me <laughs> senior debut at the world cup where england win a silver medal yeah i was like a rabbit in headlights really just running around <clears throat> sort of just absolutely wore myself out in about 30 seconds just running around aimlessly but absolutely loved it i'll never forget that uh, what was it like going into that environment with so many unbelievable players like a lot of olympic silver medalists in there um did you feel prepared did you feel prepared to go into that environment and just talk and also from a bucks point of view a lot of your games have been televised and having that sort of fanfare and razzmatazz around your bucks games made you feel prepared or a bit more prepared for crowds and a bit more attention on you? Probably more so, yeah. There was um it was quite a good buzz and a hype about sort of books. There was some like a good back into it. There's some questionable commentary on it. But it was um <laughs> it was yeah, like a good hype for it all. And I guess yeah, that sort of I was climatized a little bit, but for the magnitude of sort of the World Cup over there it was it was pretty mind blowing anyway. And then what were the next steps after that? That was in 2018. And then you went on to play eight World Series tournaments in your debut year on the series, I think. So yeah, the, right, yeah. the move into full-time professional rugby must have been pretty swift after that. Yeah, so obviously coming straight, from, well, with the setup that we had at Northumbria, it was pretty much near on a, a professional environment anyway. I think it's safe to say um like with the snc twice a week you're training and all the schedule it wasn't too far off sort of going into that professional environment down at sevens um so it obviously took a bit of time to climatize and then yeah like you said i was fortunate enough to keep fit and keep performing um for these tournaments and managed to go to eight countries around the world playing rugby in my in my first year which was which uh, I'll remember forever, I think. Um, and then, yeah, I was unfortunately picked up an injury in Singapore on my eighth, so missed London and Paris, and then was fit to start the next season. And Will was very modestly admitted that he was England's seventh player of the year as well in 2019, weren't you, Horse? I think you mentioned it, I didn't mention it, but well, you know, that's, it's my job to mention it, mate. So unfortunately, I have to and let, let's we'll touch on England sevens because it's in uh, well it's not in a precarious state anymore it's in a pretty dire state that the RFU are no longer funding it and well who knows what is going to happen in Olympic year in terms of GB and also getting England back onto the series as and when that happens so for a lot of players they are, have now been thrust into a world where they no longer have their seven careers to fall on or to pursue. You've got a contract at Bath now, but having your mechanical engineering degree in your back pocket, did you feel a little bit more assured maybe than the others coming out of England sevens? Like having that degree, does that, does that make you feel good about your prospects after rugby or you know, if it was to all stop tomorrow? yeah definitely i think having that under your belt is always something that you can fall back on i think even now being at bath lads sort of my age that have been playing through academies from 16 on they haven't 
got like a degree behind them. Uh, and I think it's definitely a sort of bit of reassurance that if anything was to happen sort of throughout my career, then at least I've got, I've got that to fall back on. I mean, I've been sort of doing little bits of not so much work experience, but going to, like I went to McLaren and working to meet some contacts and sort of just feed that interest of engineering that I've still got and just sort of keep touching base really. Cause it's uh, something that I'm interested in uh, and quite passionate about. So yeah, I'm keeping it pretty close. It's um, like you say, it's, it's pretty invaluable invaluable that I've got it to fall back on. Do you see a difference between uh, your rugby upbringing to guys who've come through academies or have always played professional rugby? Yeah, uh, I think it is quite a contrasting sort of route, really. Um, yeah, they've been at academies and things throughout throughout their careers. And like I say, it wasn't until second year that it sort of became a viable sort of pathway for me. So I guess having that full uni sort of lifetime for three years is is what a lot of lads haven't had um yeah so i think it is quite different other than the other than the rugby what were the best bits about your three years at northumbria what are the long lasting uh, memories i think it's just the people that you meet if you like your uni rugby the social scenes um you're all so tight and you're making friends for life really like even Every morning, I, I'm in so many group chats from lads from uni that are posting memories and pictures and videos of all sorts. And they're sort of the mates that you're going to have for life, really. Um, I'm sure Dazzle vouch for it. He'll, he's still pretty close with Mickey and other lads that he was up at Newcastle with. And I think it's just, yeah, the people you meet and the memories that you have are pretty invaluable and they stay with you for, forever. Yeah, I've. I mean, I've got to say, all my mates from Exeter who I played rugby with, like, we're in WhatsApp group. We have a Christmas dinner all together still. And yeah. I left 13 years ago. So, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't stop. Yeah, I know. I know. Tough paper round, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I was... I'm probably the worst rugby player on this chat at the moment, but I definitely would have tried the hardest. Uh, so incredibly mediocre, but uh, absolutely loved my rugby. And I guess what I took from my time at Exeter was being part of the committee. I was in charge of the club website, which uh, was as unglamorous as it sounds. We're talking pre-Facebook, pre-Instagram, when we had MSN messenger boards where we used to communicate and post team sheets on, it was called the banter board. Um, but it kind of gave me a taste of the media side of rugby. And while I didn't immediately pursue it, I've got a degree in economics and I worked in the city for close to a decade. But after becoming disillusioned with the city, I started writing for websites for free and for the rugby paper. I got my first break writing for the rugby paper. And then I was, I was at the Bucks final when Exeter beat uh, Hartbury. Oh no, we lost, we lost Hartbury. Harry Randall, sorry, scored, scored two tries right at the end to beat Exeter. And the film crew who were recording the game it turns out that I'd played sevens for this guy's team in Kenya two years before I uh, got chatting to him and he was looking for a new presenter commentator and he thought that I'd be pretty good so he gave me a break on in a tens tournament in Ibiza turned around he said look can uh, can you come out to Ibiza for a week and I'll uh, pay for all your expenses and pay you for the tournament, I was like, I think I can manage that. Um, so I went out to Ibiza, did this 10 tournament for three days out, out there, which was absolutely surreal. And he said, look, I think you're great. And gave me an opportunity to do bucks. And I think I probably, well, for me personally, in my career, I came along at an amazing time with bucks. That It was just beginning to be televised. We had amazing players like Will breaking onto the scene. Alex Dombrandt, who obviously everybody knows for Harlequins now. 
uh, Luke Northmore, Seb Negri, Sam Skinner, who's in the European Cup final in a couple of weeks. And yeah, it just went from there. And then since that, you know, I've, I've obviously incredibly passionate about Bucks because I think about the mates and the times that I shared when I was at Exeter and it's given me my break. But yeah, now working, I do work for BT Sport. I've done some internationals in Europe, Switzerland versus um, Switzerland versus Portugal, I've done. Uh, I've got a seventh podcast with some of Will's teammates, Tom Mitchell and Rich de Carpentier, which is a, a sore point between us because Will's, Will's yet to be a guest on the pod. But we did, big him, we did big him up and we gave him a try of the season this year. If anyone's tuning into this, you need to get on and see his try against France in the quarterfinals in Dubai when he, w- he wins it at the, at the death. It is an absolutely epic bit of footage. But yeah. Um, Don't try and claw it back. I haven't featured on there, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's still tender. We'll get you on. We'll get you on. It's a sympathy season. vote. Um, so yeah, I, I think that, that that kind of comes back to my question to Dad. That, and it's actually something I didn't think about when I first went to university. I was solely fixed on playing. I thought, right, I've, I've got to play first team. If I don't play first team, it's a failure. But actually coming out of university and the rugby club, I got so much more. I got experience in journalism and sort of digital journalism, I guess. Uh, being a member of the committee, a really wide rugby network, and then an affiliation to Bucks, which turned out to be my break in, in coming into media. So I think that that's like my takeaway from it, that it's, while the match day 23 of the first team they're legends and you want them to win bucks but it's the whole club aspect it's the social sex it's the it's the fixture sex it's the it's the pr guys it's the the guys in the fourth team who are noisiest on the touchline that's what it's all about basically 